was the two things. Uh, and uh, the XML is, is read by the script. We parse the XML and then we do whatever is needed uh, in the script itself. So I'll go ahead and do a quick demo of that. I've got uh, a total here of 488 here at the end. If I go over here to PAW, I'll go ahead and hit the, the send button. And you should see that sure enough, a new record came in here. And this is the XML payload that I sent with that. Uh, you can see that uh, it, it uh, went out and it updated this job and um, it sent back the result here. So, uh, that's kind of where it all started and we weren't even using, I don't know if you would, you really, I'm not sure if you'd even call it a web service at that point. I mean, we were really just hitting the, the XML engine uh, and using the built-in native FileMaker. Um, uh, and, it's, and it has worked great, but over time, uh, we've been wanting to, to kind of raise the bar on that. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump out of here and close this up and switch back to my keynote. Let's see here. So later on, and this is kind of time permitting as well, I'll show the new method because we've developed a kind of a more, uh, what you would consider a classical uh, or a, a standard web service um, uh, for that same integration. The next one I wanna show is this e-commerce integration. And uh, this is for uh, a, a client of ours where we developed the e-commerce side of it. And then we got to a point where we needed to be able to integrate with FileMaker, um, both to send orders, um, but also in some cases to do authentication. So I'm gonna jump over real quick and show a demo of that. All right, so let's see here. Don't need that, don't need that. And actually I'm gonna live dangerously here and get out of one VPN and see if I can get into another VPN without actually losing everyone. That seems to have worked, that's good. And let's see. Mm -hmm. All right, this is an old dog solution. Um, I did not develop this to begin with, uh, but I did develop all of the, uh, the websites of it. Uh, as soon as this thing starts up, uh, I'm gonna bring up the website while this is working. And let's take a look here. All right, so this is their website and they have an award business. So if you work for a company for 10 years and it's time for you to get your, you know, like your service award for a watch or whatever you might get, um, people are able to log on to their system and, uh, and choose uh, what they might want. And access denied, that's not good. There we go, okay. Not sure what happened there. So these are all the things that I could choose and this is being served up from their FileMaker system. And what I wanna show you is over here in administration, I'm gonna go and open up this web file and I'm gonna take a look at the request and response page. So every time someone logs in to their solution, it creates a record. Again, this is very similar to what I just showed uh, with the first solution. Uh, in this case, um, what's happening is a little bit more advanced because this is actually hitting a, our PHP page and our PHP page is sending this request to FileMaker and it gives us more flexibility. It's not just hard coded to, um, to one endpoint. We can actually do multiple different endpoints. And in fact, this is, uh, this is an endpoint that gets run when we need to authenticate. So if I were to come over here and for example, let's say that I log out and let's say that it's time to log back in, you can see the, the record count over here. And when I log in, it's gonna create another record here and you can see that uh, everything was okay with that. And so all it did was um, call a PHP page that created this record. And then this record um, was able to, to parse out the request and do whatever is needed. Um, for example, I might have a, a, you know, a bad password or an auth code that's uh, in their terms um, that's expired. 
uh, and it would actually figure that out. And then of course, if there was an order um, that was processed, then the, the order, all of the order information would get submitted by the e-commerce application and then FileMaker, this was developed, you can tell this was developed when we had uh, uh, JSON and FileMaker. So we were able to uh, process all that information about the order and create all the records in FileMaker and do our thing. So that's our second demo. I'll go ahead and close out of here. I have to admit, it's kind of strange doing this presentation because I can't get any feedback from anyone. So um, I'll, I'm going to try to keep moving along. Um, and I've got that going. All right. Let me disconnect from that VPN. Um, Mike, I, I am keeping an eye out for people raising their hands in the list. So uh, okay. if any questions come up, I'll let you know. Okay. Let me uh, continue on then. All right. So I have another integration. I'm not going to show this, but I have an integration with PayPal and this is a webhook integration. And um, it actually came after we did the e-commerce solution. I was looking at that and I was like, huh, it'd be really easy for me to, to reuse that. And that was really the idea was um, to build something that we could easily reuse on, on you know, future projects. And also to make it easy for us when we need it to, you know, basically develop a new endpoint for somebody. Uh, so the PayPal webhook uh, is linked up to my PayPal account. And when we sell one of our, uh, our smart pill licenses, uh, I will get uh, a webhook will fire uh, depending on the, um, on the, uh, what happens. So in this case, I've said, Hey, uh, when you get, uh, when you receive payment, I want to get a webhook notification sent to this URL. And that URL is, is our endpoint, um, and it gets the um, uh, it gets the payload from PayPal to find out you know which invoice was paid, and then it goes into our FileMaker system, and it finds that invoice and it marks it as paid, and it also you know stores the the PayPal transaction information. So it's really nice. You don't have to do anything. Those webhooks are are super powerful. And then I think my last one here is uh, where I'm going to switch over and actually have, um, I'm going to have Trevor talk about this. I'm going to bring up the legally sign website and uh, Trevor, would you mind giving us a little, uh, you know, heads up on, on what you did with legal e-sign and the, and what you would do different if you had uh, kind of a more standardized uh, framework in place? Sure. Hi everyone. Uh, Trevor Gildersleeve here. Uh, so legal e-sign is a is similar to DocuSign or uh, you know it's for collecting any kind of web signature for contracts. And I have a customer that their main business is getting uh, rights and permissions for works to incorporate in uh, higher education books and uh, online learning materials. So they send out hundreds of contracts. Um, Per project, so sometimes you know 500 contracts in a in a month, and they I had developed a system uh, in FileMaker for them from scratch that they had been using, um, but the next step was to be able to send these contracts out uh, automatically as just part of the workflow and also collect the results of those contracts, um, and not have to follow up and just have have a service do all of that work for them, so. Part of that, legally sign has a very nice API to to manage all of the uh, integrations. And this was this was probably six years ago, I'd say seven years ago now. Um, and you know, JSON was not part of it. Insert from URL was not part of FileMaker at the time. And I was familiar with uh, PHP, so that was my you know natural go-to was to to do all of the integration via PHP and then just use the PHP API to send the data back and forth between FileMaker, PHP, and then therefore the integration to legally sign. So the way it was done was all, all PHP. And so PHP would make the requests out to legally sign. Legally sign would then contact the, the, the customer to send them the contract. They would do their online uh, signatures, fill out the contract, and then when that was done, 
what legally sign would do is they had a webhook or a callback to post the results of contracts you know as they were completed or as they were rejected so I just had a, a simple PHP page that would uh, receive the payload from legal e-sign to get the results of that uh, contract. And then it would push that data into FileMaker, you know, do some updating of the records, and, and then you know, that completed the full life cycle of, of that contract. So that was all done you know, prior to what Micah and I had envisioned where we had a tool that was generic that we could have published this uh, endpoint, you know, web service for receiving those callbacks or the, you know, those webhooks from legal sign. So I essentially hard coded a single page for that single solution to be able to, you know, handle the payload and update FileMaker. So that was a, a one-off, you know, that was the way we kind of had to do it back then, uh, unless you spent a lot of time developing, you know, everything in PHP, but, this was just one off for this customer. Yeah, I think that's the approach that a lot of people have taken where they've um, you know, created custom PHP code uh, just for that particular purpose. And we realized somewhere you know, along the way that, hey, we could probably make it a little bit more generic and we could make it easier for us to, you know, web services are pretty systematic. Um, if we just had a way to get the request not have to actually handle it in PHP. Um, I mean, both Trevor and I do PHP work, but you know, we're FileMaker developers at heart. So it's great to be able to get that information into FileMaker easily and then do what you want to with your own scripts. Uh, Micah, Michael Frankel has a question. Yeah. This is probably more for Trevor. Uh, two questions. One, when you were evaluating legally sign versus DocuSign. Did you find that it was easier to work with and it was too also less expensive? I'm evaluating this for a customer and DocuSign is obscenely expensive for a lot of requests. Yes, uh, I was looking at DocuSign and my customer was very cost conscious and I found legally sign and they were, they were relatively new and they're out in the UK and, but they do support all of the uh, different uh, uh, legal requirements for you know what considered to be you know a, a legal document, and they were significantly less expensive. And it just so happened that he was developing this API um, at the time that I approached him. So I had a I had an inside leg up on getting what I needed added to the API. He was very responsive to anything that I needed. And he was developing and, and doing fixes as, as I was integrating with it. So I had a, you know, just a direct line essentially to the owner and the developer of, of the product. And actually, I think his price has gone up, but he's locked me in at a price. I'm not sure what they're quoting now, but it is on the website, but it's definitely a lot less expensive than legal Lisa. It's been very reliable as well, hasn't it, Trevor? Yeah, it's it's been you know it's been years and it's just I haven't had to, to look at yeah, it. I haven't it had to works. do anything to it. It just works. Yeah. Well, yeah, because because the price I got yesterday for five hundred requests a month from DocuSign was about seventeen thousand dollars a year. Oh. Which to, which to me yeah. seemed a little outrageous. So. Yeah, this is you know a couple hundred dollars um, at most. I think a month. I don't even think it's that much. Wow. Wow. Okay. Great, I appreciate it, thank you. Yep. I'm not sure how to raise my hand. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Word bomb on. Um, Michael, uh, you said you worked on the PayPal interface, uh, the webhook. Yes. Um, I've been able to, uh, so if you make a payment to PayPal, then PayPal comes back with a message, you know, says uh, the status of the payment, you know, it's pending or approved. Right. Um, I have it sent to a webhook, then I, I, I can read that, then PayPal, so you're supposed to send it back to PayPal that then confirmed that this was actually the stuff they sent to you, the, the information package. I haven't right. been able to get that to work, the confirmation. Is that something you, you got to work or um, that step? Um, I think there's a way that you can confirm that you're saying that you can authenticate the, the request. There's like yeah, a, so a, a key in there or something like that. 
the payload package you get from PayPal, um, right. the, that says, you know, pay, payment completed, you know, something like that. But then you're supposed to send it back to the PayPal server to verify that actually PayPal sent this and there was right, no right. mess with it. I know what you're talking about, but no, I haven't done that yet. Um, yeah. so, okay. And that, that, that may be something that's a little bit more difficult to do in FileMaker. Um, you know, sometimes when you use like the PayPal libraries, like for example, the PHP library, they probably have um, a method that, you know, that, that makes it easy to do that. Um, in FileMaker, I think we probably can do it. We just have to figure out how to, how to make the, uh, the request and um, do that verification step. But that is important. Um, I think if I was gonna do it for a client, I would need to make sure that uh, that, that, was, uh, that request was coming from a verified source. Yeah, exactly. And I'm doing the PHP and then uh, I use the example and the example doesn't work. I paste it, post it on their site. It's been a frustrating process, uh, basically. Um, anyway, if anybody has experience with that, then uh, please uh, give me a call or um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. That sounds good. Any other questions uh, while we're kind of at this spot? All right. And no raised hands at this time. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what does it take to actually do one of these projects? And um, some of the things to consider, like, you know, we kind of spread this development cost over time, um, every time kind of trying to raise the bar a bit. More recently, I've been really trying to push forward on this thing, and I, I have spent a fair amount of my own time on this. Um, and so it, it can, there can be a fair amount of that. Um, yeah, you have to kind of know what you're getting into. It, and, and there's probably something to be said for trying to keep it simple as well. Um, so if you're gonna do this development, you know, like a lot of us, if you're doing it for the first time, you, you're gonna start off with your own environment and you're gonna have, uh, you know, everything on one environment. But then when you finally go to production, uh, you're going to find that you know you, you no longer want to do development uh, on the same server. So you're going to need to set up multiple environments. Um, you know, I would say at a minimum, you're going to want a, a, a test environment or a test slash dev environment and a production environment. Um, if you're going to uh, provide web services to other to outside teams, uh, outside developers, then you really got to have a test environment because you don't, you know, they're going to have to be given time to do their testing and they're not going to want to test against production. So you have to have those in place, uh, you know, monitoring your web service. Obviously, if you've got it out there and it's live, you got to make sure it's up and running. Uh, we do monitoring for our FileMaker servers and there's a relatively easy way. Uh, we use, uh, I think it's uh, 24 by seven. Uh, it's really great service, good value. And uh, they have uh, services that will, monitor your web service, they can make a call and make sure that a certain signature of, you know, JSON return uh, is received and that type of thing. Uh, then there's the security aspect. I'm gonna show kind of two security approaches that we've taken. Uh, one is to just uh, use FileMaker uh, um, security and pass it through. Um, of course, you have to have a FileMaker account for that. And of course, that's the way that the, the web XML interface works. It's also the way that the, the REST interface works. Um, with REST, there's an extra step of you know getting a token and then using that, but you still need a username and password up front. Um, one of the things that we've done to make it a little bit easier for us is to uh, issue tokens or API keys. And we have a little bit of sophistication in that, so we can give somebody a key and instead of having to give them an account, they can use the key. Uh, and that key can actually be restricted uh, to certain endpoints. So if you have an endpoint that's sensitive, maybe it has uh, some HR information, you don't want people, everyone to have access to that, you can um, issue what's called a restricted key and they can only hit endpoints that you list. And then documentation is another big one. You know, if you're gonna have a web service out there, you need to have documentation. People need to be able to understand how it works. Uh, and I mentioned uh, uh, the open API stuff a little bit. Uh, Open API makes it uh, really great for documentation, even uh, not only documentation, but even a way to to test your web service right on the web page. So, um, if anybody's used the you know the new uh, REST API, or not actually that new. So, um, if you're using the REST uh, data API or the admin API, um, you know there's nice documentation built in for that. So, uh, 
All right, now I think we're gonna do kind of a little bit more of a deep dive into the, the life cycle of how these requests uh, are coming in from the consumer uh, and how we're processing them uh, in, in our approach to this. So first of all, on the left here, I've got my consumer and uh, you saw PAW earlier and, and when we do a demo with, the, with Trevor, he's gonna be using PAW, but a consumer can be anything. I mean, most likely it's another server somewhere. Um, uh, you know, another system. So it's web services are typically, you know, system to system uh, uh, communication. So the, the request comes in and we have a PHP page that is going to handle that request. Now we're just using uh, FileMaker's uh, install of PHP and um, it's relatively easy to, to put that piece of uh, PHP in place. Um, and I'm not gonna show any PHP development work. Um, there's nothing that you have to do in PHP. That's been kind of one of our things is, let's get that done, let's get that working. And then we do everything on the FileMaker side. So everything is gonna be uh, done within FileMaker. So PHP is gonna talk to, um, is gonna talk to the FileMaker server, the web publishing engine. Uh, it's either gonna go through XML eventually, um, that's kind of on the, the Trevor backlog list right now. We're gonna develop uh, the communication via REST. Um, so you could do it either way. It doesn't really matter a whole lot. Um, I, I, I'd be interested to test performance to see what happens, but in general, we're not uh, doing big payloads. Um, so at any rate, PHP is smart enough to figure out what this request is about, and it sends a request to the web publishing engine. The web publishing engine, um, you know, it, it's it, in the request, it's a two-step um, process. It says, hey, I want you to create a new record, and it posts uh, the, the request information into that record, so the record gets created, and then one of the things you can do is, you know, when you call the web publishing engine, you can say, not only create the record, but also run this script. So that's, that's all it does is it creates the record and it runs a standard script. And it's always the same script that it runs. Um, in our earlier versions, we actually had to have some intelligence kind of on the PHP side of it um, because we didn't have perform script by name. So that's kind of a game changer for this approach because uh, it's very dynamic now. Um, we have one script that gets called. It looks at the request and says, oh, you just called this endpoint, and I know that this endpoint is mapped to a script with this name. And so it'll call that script. Um, and you only have to have one. Um, so it's always dynamic. Uh, so I mentioned the new record and then the target script. Okay, yeah. So after that new record gets created and the script gets called, it then uses, like I say, perform script by name and it calls the target script. Um, and the target script, of course, what it's gonna receive are the parameters that were submitted with the request back on the consumer side of things. And that's basically all of all that this, this is, the script is called EP script. All it knows is that it needs to call a certain script and it needs to deliver the payload um, from the request. Then it's completely up to that script to do what it wants to um, with those parameters. So it's just like calling a script with, uh, you know, script parameters, you know, with a bunch of JSON script parameters. So here's kind of the details of it. I've, I've kind of gone through this, but uh, consumer sends a request by HTTP. Uh, it hits our PHP page. Uh, PHP does a little bit of checking uh, you have to have at least some authorization present. Um, like I said, it either has to use basic auth, which is gonna be a uh, username and password, or it could use one of our um, um, bearer auth, which is like a token, uh, that's our API key. Uh, if you don't have any of that in your request, uh, PHP will just reject it. Uh, otherwise, for the most part, PHP doesn't really care what's in there, it's just gonna send it to FileMaker and let FileMaker decide what to do. Um, and let's see here. So EP request is our main script. Uh, if you send in an API key, uh, then EP request will make sure that that, that API key is valid, that it, ex that it actually exists. But then it'll also see, hey, which endpoint did you call? And do you have access to that endpoint uh, if it's a restricted key? Um, it, EP request is gonna build up the script parameters. Uh, and then it is going to use perform script by name. Now, 
just want to stress this again. I mean, at this point, it's, it's as if you were just like calling a subscript. Um, and that's literally what it is. It's, you know, you're in EP request. I've got a body that has my parameters in it and it's just going to call a script with, you know, a JSON script parameter. Uh, pretty standard FileMaker stuff these days. Um, Micah, uh, there was another uh, question. Oh, the raised hand went away. Oh, there it is again, Ward. Yeah, has, has go for question. it, go for it. Yeah, I was thinking maybe we should wait. Um, can you talk about, uh, if you do perform script by name, can you talk about security there as well? Uh, if you, I mean, you have to, have, well, I guess I can talk about, if it, it depends on if you're using uh, pass-through authentication uh, or uh, if you're using our API key. So if you're using pass-through, then it's, it's a real FileMaker account. And uh, on the PHP side of things, it doesn't have any idea what that account is uh, allowed to do. Uh, so it would all depend on, on, on that account. If you use an API key, then we have to use a stored account. And so you would have to make sure that that stored account has access to perform the script that's needed. Yeah, and that and that you manage within the FileMaker security settings. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So, just to uh, you know, like in the PHP, one of the first checks it does is it says, "Hey, did you send me in uh, your own user account and password?" And if you do, it just passes it through. It says, "Okay, let's see what happens." Um, if you send an API key in, uh, there's a configuration. And so we have a, a, a standard account and password that's used. Uh, everything would fail, of course, if you know you try to, to do something that 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 account doesn't have access to. Um, right. I'm just thinking from that that an, uh, another system at the uh, earlier up in the stream gets compromised, and somebody tries to run a script, delete record script or something that that was not. Um, you didn't intend that the user could run that or the API could run that if you were able to catch that. You probably, um, I'll, probably I'll show the perform script by name, but there is, uh, there's a mapping between the endpoint and the script that gets called. So you can't, um, you can't just ad hoc any script that you might want to call. It has to be configured so that that script uh, gets called when a certain endpoint gets called. Uh, so and, and, you know, you get to write the script, so you have to decide, you know, uh, what is allowed. Right. Yeah, and you certainly would not want to generically let let the the caller write any script name and have that be executed. No, no, and a web re, you know web service is all based on the endpoint, so you get to configure. You know, like in the one we're going to show, I think it's just slash hello, and it's a real simple mechanism. Um, slash hello is. Uh, related to a certain script. So when uh, when the request comes in, we just make that relationship and we go, oh, this is the script to call. Um, so we don't know what the script is until the endpoint is put in that field. And um, then we call that script by name. So it's real simple. Yeah, so but I also have been using um, you know, file manage security in FileMaker and right. which user is allowed which to run one script. But I was wondering if that was a little overdone to do that. And what your approach to that is. Okay, well, I think it probably gets into a little bit, uh, too detailed. Yeah. A, little, a little too detailed maybe to, to get into, but um, uh, there's certainly, you know, it's, it respects FileMaker security. Uh, it has to, I mean, there's, there's no way around it, so. Thank you. Um, the last step here, number 10, uh, once, the, once the, um, uh, the target script is run, it then returns the result back uh, to PHP. And then PHP just kind of like passes that along, uh, you know, as the response uh, to the consumer. So again, this is just the diagram of how this is working. And uh, the server we're gonna show you is uh, hosted out on uh, AWS. That's our FileMaker server. And everything is running on that FileMaker server. Um, so I think it's time for demo again. And Trevor and I are going to kind of switch back and forth on this. I'll start off by showing our server here, or our FileMaker solution. And this is something we call strut. 
this is a listing of all of the requests that have come in. So every time a request comes in, like I was mentioning, um, a record gets created. And uh, Trevor, I don't know if you want to just, you know, create a record for me. All right, cool. So Trevor just created, he just hit our endpoint. Our endpoint created this record. And just by looking at it, I can see that uh, it used the, the strut endpoint account. That's our standard account. Uh, it was successful. This is the path that he hit. This is ultimately the, this is the target script. Uh, and it looks like he did a post. And um, I'm gonna do something to this script. I'm gonna change it so that it only allows a get. And Trevor, this is probably gonna fail for you, but go ahead and try your request again. So it's kind of cool. Um, in FileMaker, I changed the, the method that's allowed. And I said, hey, you know what, Trevor, you, you can't hit me with post anymore. You, you have to hit me with get. But it's not a very good real world example. So I'll go ahead and switch things back. But this is what I was talking about as far as not having to make changes in PHP. Everything is configured on the FileMaker side. Um, if I wanted to look at this, I could see that there was an error. I can see that it returned uh, you know, code 405. Um, and if I wanted to dive into the request a little bit to maybe help uh, Trevor, you know, troubleshoot it, I could look into that request because I have all of the information. This is one of the really nice things is um, we, we gather up a whole bunch of information about that request. Um, you can see the path here. Um, that's how it makes its relationship to the target script. You can see the method that was used. I can see Trevor's remote address. Uh, I get a listing and this is all in JSON. So it's really easy to parse. I get the headers. Um, should probably say PAW in there somewhere, I'm guessing. Yep, there's PAW, there's the version he's using. Um, doesn't look like any cookies got sent in. It was a post, so there's no URL parameters. Um, I do get all of the PHP server vars, um, just in case there might be something in here that I wanna see about this, uh, this request. And I can see here, this is the actual body of the request that, that Trevor sent in. Um, looks like his favorite color is blue and he sent me this message. Um, and here's what went wrong. So it looks like we, um, our, our code returned 405, method not allowed. Uh, it sent him back application JSON. And um, we had an event that says, just told him that that method was not allowed. This is actually what Trevor would have seen in PAW. Um, he would have seen some JSON that has these events, um, giving him some information about it and then uh, that it was a status error. So this is kind of our standard response as a, as a web service response. Um, so now what I wanna do is, I think I wanna switch over to Trevor for a minute. Um, Trevor, you wanna, you wanna uh, I th I'm not sure if I have to stop sharing or if you can just take over. Uh, yeah, you have to stop sharing for him to, to share. You should be able to share now, Trevor. Uh, oh. I have to grant some system preferences. Uh, okay. Oh, well, actually, it's not going to let me because it wants me to quit Zoom to be able to. Oh. Uh, <laughs> to okay. allow to do it. All right. Well, that's no good. Uh, yeah. I'll go ahead and switch back over to to sharing. I give it a try anyway, um, even though it said that um, it may work. All right, let's try it, share. Oh. Never believe those computers. Uh, it looks like it's sharing. Can I yeah. yeah, it's working right. for sure. All right. So I kind of fixed that for you. Um, I would think you could probably run this again, right? Right, so I'm just hitting the forward slash hello sending in these parameters just as I was. As Michael pointed out, this was the response that I received as the consumer. And it was logged within the FileMaker as well. So if I rerun this, so now I'm getting a status 200 with a, with a success message. So we're back in business, but um, that's, only, that's only if you send in the color blue. Why don't you go ahead and try sending in um, brown? 
All right, so in PAW, that's really easy to do. I'm just essentially changing what's going to be passed in and then just rerun this. So now I'm getting an event. Uh, it's a HTTP code 406, so it's not acceptable, which again is all configurable within FileMaker. Essentially, you know, we're using FileMaker to drive how, how this web service responds when certain conditions aren't met. And yeah, so this favorite color is brown is not blue. So obviously, please try again. So that, that logic all exists within a standard FileMaker script. And I really apologize, but my neighbor's getting some tree work done, so it's about to get really loud. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna uh, switch. Uh, why don't you go ahead and um, let me switch back over and I will um, make a little change to that because I think uh, it's a little too restrictive uh, to only allow uh, uh, blue. Switch back over to blue. Uh, go ahead and stop sharing for a second. And um, I wanna show the, the script side of things. All right, uh, Michael, you guys have just about five minutes left. Okay, very good. All right, so let's see here, share screen. All right, my, she my screen should be sharing again. Yep. And so now I'm just in my comfort zone here. I'm in FileMaker and I'm validating the color and I'm, I'm saying, hey, you know what, favorite color uh, has to be blue. And that this is where Trevor is getting that message. If I were to, let's say, comment this out and then put a little bit uh, less restrictive code in place, um, this calculation is gonna allow both blue and green. And I'll cheat a little bit because we're, we're running low on time and I'll, I'll just do this in PAW myself instead of switching back over to Trevor. But I have this problem with brown just like I was showing before, and it says not acceptable. But now if I switch over to green, it still says not acceptable, and that's because I didn't save my script. So I'll save my script, which is gonna allow blue or green or blue, and now I'm back in the green. I'm getting a 200 okay message. Uh, and again, it's all done from FileMaker, and I didn't have to do any PHP coding at all. Um, Trevor, I'm sure I'm missing something that we were doing with this part of the demo, but uh, can you think of anything else we should add? No, I, I just think the takeaway here is to, to understand that you know, we're exposing a, a, an endpoint to, to the public you know, outside world that FileMaker can interact with using just FileMaker scripts. You know, in my legal e-sign example, you know, I had to write a PHP page to be able to handle the handle the, the payload and push it into FileMaker. This, you can take a script, click a few buttons, and all of a sudden it becomes an endpoint that can be hit, and then you just write your FileMaker script to be able to manipulate and save that data and, and use it however you wish. Well, Bob, I know we're we're getting close. Um, do we have until the end of the hour? Uh, yes, you do. I'm okay. sorry, you had you had a little more than five minutes. You actually got about eight more minutes. My apologies. Okay. Cool. Well, I think I hopefully I have time to talk a little bit about Open API, and um, this is actually some brand new, like just got it working this morning type work here. So I'm really living dangerously, but this is my development version of Strut. And I'm gonna go down here to this thing called App API. And what this will do is it'll, it'll create this JSON for me. And then I can just go up to Swagger Hub and I can paste that in there and I'll have a, a, a brand new API on, on Swagger Hub. So I think what I did actually is I think, I think I actually created an FM disk um, API. So let me clear it out. Let me build it. And then, oh yeah, this will actually, I actually got this to work so I can actually push this automatically because Swagger Hub actually has an API. So it's an API tool, but of course they have an API to upload your API. I'll start by just copying this and I'll show you what Swagger looks like. And I'll come over here and say, okay, hey Swagger Hub, I would like to create a new API 
and I don't want any template. And I'm going to call this just really quick foo. And this is going to be 0 .0 0 0.0.1. And hopefully that's enough. Create it. All right. So I have my API. And I'm just going to hit paste. And it's kind of cool. Swagger Hub is smart enough to know that it uses YAML, but I have JSON on my clipboard. So it'll do a really nice thing. And if everything works out. That built my API, like this is my open API spec generated from FileMaker. So this, this, my FileMaker solution knows all of this information. It knows, you know, what can be, uh, you know, what are the parameters that can be posted? This is real simple, just a message that gets posted into it. Um, it'll show, you know, what it's gonna return. Um, and I think that's, I think that's probably about as, that's a very simple API. Now, if I had um, if I had implemented this in my test server, I could try it out, and that's kind of the cool thing here too with with Swagger Hub is you can go in here, and um, I wouldn't recommend this, but I, I I put my API keys right in the documentation just to make it super easy for me, um, and I'm pretty sure this will fail because if I run it, it says um, well it says something bad. But, and I'm not going to try to get into that. And the truth is, is I haven't actually put the, uh, the script, uh, the target script on my test server yet. Um, one of the things that's a problem with, uh, can be a problem with Swagger Hub is you can't really test against your like local development environment really easily. But the thing I really wanted to point out here was that um, this is a standard and it's a very sophisticated standard that, that, that basically explains everything about a web service, you know, even down to the, like the authentication that you can use to talk to that web service. And as a FileMaker developer, you know, I mean, we're, we're a little bit poor on standards. We don't really have a lot of standards that we can use. So I think we have to borrow from other standards. And I think this is a great standard. Uh, it's something that we're trying to do. And, um, you know, I can see a point where every one of our scripts will have its own spec and you'll have this nice documentation that explains how to use it. Um, another big thing is that we've started actually doing testing um, using our uh, web service interface. So, you know, that's another thing that's not super easy to do is to test your FileMaker scripts. And with this, you can actually hit them programmatically and you can hit them with, you know, things that you expect to fail and things that you expect to succeed. Um, and check the results, you know, very programmatically. So I think there's a, there's a, I'm excited about being able to use this standard. And of course, it has a great benefit of being able to, to produce, a, you know, web service documentation uh, that you can put out there for people to be able to use. So um, I'm going to go ahead and use my last maybe four minutes to, to open it up to uh, some more questions if people have them. Okay, Michael has a question. Um, just one question. Um, I, I use Postman a lot. I've done a lot of integrations with Stripe and several others. Why do you like Paw? Um, I, you know, I've never used Postman. I've always used kind of a Paw. Or I've also used PHP Storm as built-in testing. Um, one of the things I really like about Paw is the ability to manage these environments. So you can you can see this just says default base URL here. I'm, this probably can be done in Postman too, but I've got all these different environments and I have the same you know um, uh, keys available or the same uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. merge fields available. Um, that's a that's a big feature for me. Um, I don't know how that compares to Postman though. Well, I, what I like about this from I mean I've used Postman on a lot of different. I like that you can see everything in one screen. Postman shows all of it, but sometimes you have to click things and go to other windows. I like the fact that you can see your request, you can see all the all the keys there, and you can see the HTTP result. So yeah, just, it's a I nice just, tool. Um, you can look at JSON text. You know, you can get into the just the headers. Um, you can see the raw response. Uh, you know, all the it's all there and. Um, Super easy to use, and of course you can share these um, with your team. I think there's a Paw Cloud. We're not using that, but uh, yeah, that's and another thing to note about Paw is it is Mac only, but you can share. You can import and export to Postman <coughs> format. So if 
you know, customer or someone else is using Postman, you can still send them your tests and your integrations or receive what they already have and import it. Okay. Okay. Great, guys. Thanks a lot. I appreciate Along it. Along the lines, just a quick recommendation, take a look at Insomnia, uh, insomnia.rest. It's got some virtues similar to this, but it is cross-platform. Um, we moved away from Postman as well. Okay. Yeah, we're doing a lot, you know, we're doing a, a decent amount of PHP development now. And uh, that's another really nice thing when you're, when you're doing the development to be able to do the testing. Uh, another big thing I think is to be able to do like the, the recursion testing where, you know, you, you make changes to your code and then you can run a whole suite of tests. Um, you know, and imagine being able to run that suite against actually your scripts, you know, at that point, you're not actually testing Maybe you're testing a web service, but if your if your web service is backed by a FileMaker script, um, and you've got you know 15 test scripts that you want to run against it, and they all have expected results, uh, it, it starts getting pretty compelling. Jeremiah, what was the name of that serv other service you mentioned? Insomnia. It's an application name. I think the website is insomnia.rest. Great, thank you. Jeremiah, can you explain again why you moved away from Postman, sorry. Uh, Postman raised their prices for sharing and is fairly buggy and uh, doesn't have as nice of an interface or as many features. All right, well, that just about uses up our hour here. Um, Thank you so much, Micah. That was, uh, that was a great presentation. Yeah, thanks uh, for having us. And, and uh, thank you both. Yep, thank you. Yep, thank All right. You. Good seeing everyone. All right. So um, Steve Romig is up next. Steve, I see you here online. I'm here. All right. Great. Hey, guys. Good to see you. Or at least hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll turn my camera on at some point. Okay. Uh, can we just jump right into it? Uh, yeah, I think we can. All right. So uh, I think most of you know me. I'll do a quick introduction here in a bit. I understand this is your first 100% virtual FM disk meeting. We've been doing quite a few of these, actually. They've actually been working out really well. Uh, but... Um, my name's Steve Romig. I'm coming to you from beautiful Campbell, California, up north from you guys. Um, if you're keeping score at home, that's about 20 minutes from the wedge, maybe about 40-ish minutes from San Francisco, and about 20 or 30 minutes from Santa Cruz and the beach. But uh, map lessons aside, uh, many of you know me from my time in developer relations. I've been around a long time, spread out way longer than the amount of time that I've been at Claris and at FileMaker and now back at Claris again. So you might know me from my time in developer relations uh, with Delphina. Uh, some of you might know me way, way back when I was doing training back when Claris was called Claris the first time. But these days I'm part of an evangelism team at Claris helping out with education, training activities and other evangelism-ish stuff like this. So today I'm here to talk to you guys about the, the new kid on the block. Um, probably heard about it by now. Claris Connect launched on March 3rd. This is a new venture for us. Uh, we hope you're all as excited about it as we are and that um, hopefully many of you have gotten it into your hands already and have been able to play around with it. Um, <clears throat> I think I saw some of the guidelines that, uh, that Bob may have lined out for you, but um, if you're not on mute already, I'd recommend that you put yourself on mute. Um, yeah, you can use the raise your hand feature. That's fine. If you want to interrupt me, that's fine. But I've been finding that if you kind of uh, keep all of your questions until the end, that has been working better. That's not to say, again, that you can interrupt me. Uh, I've done enough of these where I feel like I've uh, baked in a lot of the questions and answers that maybe you would have. So uh, hopefully uh, that'll work out well. But again, if you want to raise your hand, that's fine. I'll try to um, keep uh, my eye on things. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. 
good question. Is it desktop one or desktop two? We'll find out here in a second. Can you guys see anything? No, I don't see anything. Come on. Oh, you know what? Maybe because it is desktop two. No, nope, this should be it. There we go. There we go. Okay. Let's go ahead and fire this up. So, uh, yeah. So today it's gonna to be all about demos. Uh, before I get into demos, I'm gonna go over a few key concepts, terms, definitions, things that will make it easier for you to work with Claris Connect. But once we get through all of that, I've got about four demos to walk through so you get a sense of what Claris Connect is really all about. Now, I'm gonna caveat my four demos with, with this uh, statement or statements um, because I want all of you guys to be able to do what I'm gonna do today. I am limiting the applications and the web services that I'm gonna interact with, with those that are free. Now, for those of you who have played around with Claris Connect already, you'll already know that many of the applications and web services require some form of payment to use. So that's not fair to all of you guys to, who, who, wanna, who, who will want to demo to have to pony up for something that you may not necessarily ever use again. Uh, now, there are also some offerings out there that have trial versions or time bond versions. I kind of stayed away from those also because you could use them once and then two weeks from now, if you wanted to do the demo again, you can't because your trial's expired. So with that said, there's only really a handful of applications and services that I can use. So some of the examples that I'm gonna show you today, they're not the most exciting, the most compelling, the most real world examples out there and definitely don't reflect the, the awesomeness that is Claris Connect. But I'm pretty sure you'll get the gist of what you can do with Claris Connect and you'll be excited to try it out if you haven't already. And I feel like this is a great compliment to Micah's presentation because it's like the flip side of the coin. He was talking about heavy API stuff. I'm gonna be talking about how you can avoid all of that stuff and do everything, well, not maybe everything, but a lot of what he was talking about in a point and click interface. So we're gonna start with a simple flow between two apps to see how easy it is to, to put together. Now, uh, I listened to about the last 30 minutes of Micah's presentation. I am not an API guy at all. So uh, that was very interesting stuff, but uh, I know that if I needed to do that stuff, I would need a weekend. And in a lot of cases, that is kind of the measuring stick. If you wanna measure or you wanna connect two applications together, uh, you gotta roll up your sleeves and dedicate a weekend to it. Now I'm a dad with two kids. I'm driving around to sports all the time. So me programming an API, we're probably talking months, not a weekend. But uh, I'm gonna show you how in about 10 or 15 minutes, including talking in my color commentary, how I'm going to connect Eventbrite to Slack. So what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna have a, a, an event in Eventbrite already, and I'm gonna make a change to it. And then lightning fast, I'm gonna get a message delivered to Slack to a particular Slack channel letting people know that there was an update to that particular event. After that, we'll make things a little harder, up the bar a little bit, uh, and we'll add in some approvals and we'll add in some conditional branching, some if statements for those of you who uh, wanna think of them as a, as a script almost. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fill out a, vac a vacation request form in type form. And then that vacation request is gonna be emailed to my manager who I'm going to be acting as. And if my manager approves that vacation request, my vacation will automatically be added to an Office 365 calendar. So in this example, I'm actually probably interacting with at least two APIs. So now instead of one weekend, or in my case, one month, now I'm probably talking a couple months to get this off the ground. And we'll be able to do this in just a few minutes also. 
Next, uh, I'm going to talk about how you can integrate with an application or a web service that Claris Connect may not directly support. Uh, using something called web hooks and callback URL. I heard that mentioned in the previous uh, presentation also. So hopefully you guys are all familiar with what those are, but I'll give you a 30 second definition of what they are when we get to them. So in this case, we're going to perform a supported action in a web service that is not directly supported by Claris Connect. And then when that occurs, I'm going to send out a tweet through my Twitter account. Now, uh, we're going to have to put on our pretend hats for this particular one. In keeping with the use of free applications and web services for my demos, uh, I'm gonna pretend that one of the web services that we actually do support, we don't support. And that service is uh, MailChimp. Um, the reason why I'm gonna use MailChimp is, it, is, is they make it very easy to set up webhooks and callback URLs. So we're going to pretend when we get to that section that we don't actually have a MailChimp connector built into Claris Connect already. We're going to pretend that it doesn't exist and we're going to connect to MailChimp using a web hook. Now, what you might have noticed through these first three demos so far, or the explanation of the first three demos, is FileMaker is not mentioned at all in any of them. Uh, it is worth noting that Claris Connect is a completely standalone product. You do not need to use FileMaker at all. Now, of course, we hope that you do, but if you choose not to, or you have a customer or a situation that doesn't have FileMaker for whatever reason, and you just want to connect web service A to application B, have at it. Claris Connect is there to help you out. You don't need to use any FileMaker databases whatsoever. But in my fourth demo, we are going to connect to a FileMaker database. So I'm going to use MailChimp again in this example, the real way, the way that you should use it by using a connector. And I'm just going to add a subscriber to a MailChimp list. And I'm going to have that information automatically added to a database that is being hosted up on the cloud using FileMaker Cloud. So got a bunch of API-like development and functionality. I'm not good at any of that. We've got about 90 minutes to two hours, including Q&A. Let's get right to it. With some definitions and key terms to understand. So maybe this slide goes without saying, but Claris Connect is our cloud-based integration platform that allows you to create entire workflows by connecting applications and web services together using point and click. It runs entirely in the cloud. There's nothing to install. You don't have to run anything once you get your, uh, your flows up and running. You could close the browser. It just works in the cloud 100%. Uh, and again, uh, Claris Connect's reason to be is to make it easier to program with APIs today. Uh, like I said, I am in this camp. The concept of programming API or API programming for, for many is an insurmountable barrier to doing things. They'll start to look at it and they'll go, they'll look at the documentation and they'll be like, I can't do this. Or they don't know how to program, they can't do this. So they run into one barrier after another. Claris Connect removes all of those barriers for you. So uh, there's no magic, no strings, no rabbits out of the hat. All we're gonna use is Claris Connect. So when you sign up for Claris Connect or when you log in for the first time, you're presented with the home page. And you'll see your team name displayed in the top left. In my case, you can see it's Steve underscore Roanmaker FileMaker.com. You can use the options menu, which the red arrow is pointing to, to manage users and to install something called an on-premise agent. Now managing users, that allows you to collaborate with other people. So if you want some help working on a particular project or a flow in a particular project, you can invite other people to uh, help you, work with you. And the on-screen, uh, I'm sorry, on-screen, on-premise agent is a special piece of software that will enable you to connect to a FileMaker server and other supported data sources that are behind a firewall or are 
otherwise in a secure location. We'll talk about that briefly in just a little bit, what the on-premise connector is all about. So Claris Connect is built on a concept of flows. You can kind of think of a flow as a script in FileMaker. They're used to automate everyday business tasks and processes. So you can create a flow that adds a username to a MailChimp subscriber list when that user subscribes to a form stack flow. I, there, the possibilities are endless. We ship with about 40 plus connectors. We'll take a look at that list in just a second as well. So as I said, flows are automations that use two or more things called components. Now a component can either be a Claris Connect utility, which I'll explain in a second, or a connector to a third party app or web service. Uh, so as I said, they're most, mostly made up of something called a component. You add components to your flows to allow you to connect to third party applications or web services, or to perform a, a specific task or action. So the term component is an umbrella term and is made up of two things. The first one is utilities. Now these are a handful or more than a handful of predefined components that ship with Claris Connect that perform a variety of data and file operations. Uh, in my demos today, I'm gonna be touching on the approval one, the dates one, and the webhook one. But you can see there's utilities to perform calculations. Uh, you can schedule the flow. You can create variables. Uh, you can do a whole bunch of stuff with the utilities that ship with Claris Connect. But the software that integrates workflows and share data between apps is called connectors. So Claris Connect ships, like I said, with about 40-ish connectors. And besides connectors to popular industry-leading applications and web services, Claris Connect also ships with special connectors to integrate with your FileMaker data. Now there's special connectors to connect to FileMaker server, as well as a solution that is being hosted uh, using FileMaker Cloud. And as I mentioned a few slides ago, we also ship with a third connector for on-premise connector that allows you to connect to either a FileMaker server behind a firewall or a MySQL data source. Now the on-premise connector acts as a gateway between your secured tied down system and the outside world. Now in order to use any of these connectors, you have to have the following. The first thing is the file has to be hosted using FileMaker Cloud or FileMaker server. The second one is the data API must be enabled on FileMaker Cloud or FileMaker Server. The third one is the FM REST extended privilege must be enabled in all files that you want to access. And maybe the most important and potentially the most misunderstood is that you need to have a valid third party SSL certificate. This means that the default one that ships with FileMaker Server for testing purposes, you can't use that one. So you actually have to have a third party SSL certificate in order to uh, connect to your data using any of these connectors. Okay, the initial step in any flow is called a trigger. Now a trigger in Claris Connect is an event in which a flow will be waiting or listening for. And then each time that that trigger event occurs, Claris Connect reacts and automatically performs the subsequent steps in that flow. So in this example, I'm checking Eventbrite for, where, for when a new attendee uh, checks in. And when they do, I want my flow to kick off and perform whatever actions I specify after it. And those steps are usually called actions. They carry out an operation in a target app or apps. Uh, they can create things, uh, update things, search. Uh, they can do a, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, typically, an action requires a set of input fields and typically returns data that can be used in subsequent steps. Now, the returned data is referred to as step data. Now, I consider step data the secret sauce of Claris Connect. 
Step data is sample data sent from one application or web service to another. This makes working with Claris Connect super easy. Now, uh, as much as I'm not an API programmer, I'm also, I would not say that JSON is in my wheelhouse either. And JSON is one of the formats that is used to transfer data from one app or web service to another. So I know JSON is supposed to be human readable and for the most part, when you use it with Claris Connect, it is, but you'll find as you are going from one application to another, sometimes you get a bunch of junk from an application that you weren't expecting and you may not be able to decipher right away because it's got like record IDs and a whole bunch of other stuff that may or may not make any sense. So the sample data or the step data, which this is, first of all, on my screen right now, this is a horrible example of what step data is because all of my values are zero. Great screenshot, Steve. But uh, basically what, is, what happens here is the JSON or the, the, the format of the data that I get from, in this case, Eventbrite is on the left-hand side in the blue bubbles and then the step data would be what is on the right hand side, which in this case is either dollar sign zero, 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 or US dollars. Uh, we're gonna be using step data a lot during all of my demos here. So you'll become step data experts. So like I said, trust me, you'll become very familiar with it at the end here. All right, we already kind of touched on this, but uh, Projects, when you create and use projects, uh, you use these to organize your flows. The very first thing that you need to do when you start using Claris Connect is you need to create a project. It's just a, a folder to hold your flows. You can have as many projects as you want. You know, in my case, I'm gonna have a demo full, I'm sorry, a demo project, but you might have one for marketing, you might have one for sales. You can create as many projects as you want to organize your flows and they all live on the home page, which uh, we saw just a few minutes ago. Uh, Clarish Connect also ships with some templates. These are some pre-built flows. Uh, they're kind of like wizards almost. They walk you through step by step. They make it a little bit easier for somebody who may not be comfortable creating, for example, a event right to MailChimp flow on their own. So it's kind of like fill in the blanks, like I said, wizard-like. Um, when you create a flow based off a template, it automatically creates a project for you. All right, we're gonna dump out of my slides here and we're gonna go straight into demos. So here is Claris Connect. I have one project already. This is my safety net in case things go horribly bad over the course of the next hour. I have a project with all the flows that we're gonna build already working and ready to go. So if for some reason something doesn't work, we can fall back to these. But we're gonna pretend that's not there. And I launch Claris Connect for the first time. As I said, the very first thing that I need to do is I need to create a project. So I'll go ahead and do that. And we'll call it my project. Click on create, it opens up that project, it's empty and it's prompting me to create my first flow. Very excited, let's go ahead and do that. I gotta give that a name. Uh, we'll call this one first flow. Now, as I said, my goal in my simple flow is to connect Eventbrite to Slack. So here are all of the utilities and the components and the connectors that we currently support. Now you'll notice that some of them appear to be grayed out and some of them appear to be selectable. As I mentioned before, the very first step in any flow is a trigger. But with that said, not all utilities and not all apps can act as a trigger. So for those that can't be a trigger, they're grayed out. I can't select them and make them a trigger. If after this 
presentation, you walk away, you don't remember anything of what I just said, you can always click on any of the utilities or the connectors and get an idea of what they're capable of doing. So for example, I'm gonna click on uh, autopilot here and you'll see that it tells me right away that this particular connector does not support being used as a trigger, but it has a whole bunch of actions that can be used, which means it can be used in subsequent steps as actions after a trigger has been fired off. Now there are plenty of utilities and connectors up here that can be used as both a trigger and an action. For example, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. I clicked on the wrong thing, let's go back. I wanted to click, click on that. You'll see that MailChimp, for example, can be used as both. It, can, it has some trigger actions and it has some action actions. Anyway, so that's a good way of being able to tell what does what, and you can also get a good idea of what the different connectors can and can't do. So we wanna start with Eventbrite. So I'm gonna click on Eventbrite and I get a list of everything that can be used as far as an action or the different things that the Eventbrite connector can look for as far as a trigger. So I can see if an order was refunded, I can see if an attendee checked in, all kinds of stuff. What I wanna do is I want to set a trigger if an event has been updated. So I'm gonna click this box right here and click on continue. Now the very first thing that happens in most case, in almost every case is that you need to tell this particular connector how to log in to this particular service. Now, a misconception early on was, oh, uh, Claris Connect gives me access to all of these different services. Uh, not true. So as I said, we're just using free ones right now. If it is a paid service, Claris Connect does not help you whatsoever uh, get your foot in the door there. You still have to be paying to use that service. But what it's asking me to do right here is how do I log in? How do I interact with this particular service? So it's asking me to connect a new account. Now, if I was doing this for the first time, it would be asking me for the equivalent of my username and password at this point. Since I've done this about a bajillion times, it's cached God knows how many times in my browser. So uh, it's asking me if it's okay for me to connect but you can just pretend that I should be entering in my username and password right here, but I'm going to say it's okay. And then I get a success message over here on the right hand side and I'm ready to move on. So I click on continue. Now, this is a little bit of a confusing spot for some people because the messaging arguably not the greatest, but what it's asking me to do here is it's basically asking me to create or trigger that uh, the, the event to happen on the events on the event bright side of things. So this is where I have to temporarily exit out of Claris Connect. I'm just going to open up a new tab and we're going to go to event bright. So I already have your guys's meetings set up in event bright right here. And all I need to do is make a small change to it. Although I have found from doing this demo enough times that all I really need to do is open it up, pretend that I made a change, whoops, click on edit. Pretend that I made a change, which I'm not gonna do, and then just click save. Now, I just wanna point out something here. Right now it just says, update the status of an event in event right to continue. Watch what happens if I click save. On the event right side of things, it saves the event, but on Claris Connect, it now says connection complete. It is now verified that it knows how to talk to Eventbrite and it allows me to save the trigger. So right then and there, I am done with setting up the trigger. Now I'm ready to set up the second part of it with connecting to Slack. Now, I wanna point something out here. Uh, for those of you who have been using Claris Connect before, you might see something new, this guy right here. I think this just happened in the last 24 hours. This is the ability to create loops in Claris Connect. Uh, 
I just played around with it for a little bit this morning. I don't have a demo to describe how it works or show how it works, but I just wanted to let you know that one of the great things about Claris Connect is that we're going to be able to add stuff to the product without you guys having to do anything at all. It's just going to show up. Now, unfortunately, we should have probably provided more warning that this was coming than just a, hey, Steve, guess what? The repeat or loops is now available uh, for you to use in your flows. But uh, we're going to ignore that for right now. And we're going to select action. Now, I get the same screen that I just saw a few minutes ago. And now it's asking me what, uh, what's the next app or utility that I want to connect with. One thing I do want to point out is that once you connect to a application or a web service, that will show up up here at the top. So we've run into some people who are like, all right, I'm going to use Eventbrite and they go here because they're in alphabetical order and they can't find it. And that's because it's up here now for you to pick easier if you want to use it in additional flows. Now it is worth noting, this, all, this works on a project by project basis. So as long as I stay within this project, Eventbrite and any other connector that I configure will show up here at the top. But if I go to another project, uh, Eventbrite will be where it should be down here at the bottom. Okay, so we're gonna pick Slack. And again, here are the list of things that I can do in Slack. I'm just gonna simply post a message, that's easy. I'm gonna click on continue. Much like what I had to do with Eventbrite, I have to tell Claris Connect how to connect to Slack. So I have to authenticate myself. Uh, say allow. This is where I would want to put in my username and password if I didn't already do it. It is successful. I'll click continue. Now here I got to answer or fill in a few additional things that I didn't have to do on the trigger side of things. And this is going to vary from connector to connector depending on what you're trying to do or what they require for you to uh, use that particular connector. So in this case, if you've used Slack before, you need to choose the channel. So I just have a sample channel here that I'm gonna use and the message that I want to post. An event has been updated. Uh, the username, I don't need to touch. The icon URL, I don't need to also. And the message attachments, I don't need to also. But let's come back and look at this for a second. Uh, this useful, no doubt about it, but it doesn't really provide any information like what event. If I had 100 events, how am I going to know which event it was? So what can we do to make this message a little more personable, a little more useful? This is when you can use that step data that I was talking about earlier. So instead of having a generic message that says an event has been updated, maybe I can do the following event has been updated, the colon. And then I can have the name of the event show up here in the Slack channel. So over here, I don't know if we have an official name for this button, but I'm calling it the step data button. If I click on this, it brings up all of the applications and services and other things that are above the step that I'm on right now and allows me to steal or borrow or take data from that particular application and use it in the application that I'm configuring. So here's where the JSON stuff comes into play. And this one's not quite as bad as some of them. You can kind of, I mean, like organization ID, I don't know that you would necessarily know what that is and some of this other stuff. But what I want to do is scroll through here until I find the name of the event, which I had already passed, which is right here. And much like you would use a, uh, like a field variable uh, on your layouts in FileMaker, it's kind of the same thing. I can uh, bring in information from previous steps into the step that I'm using right now. So now I'll see the following event has been updated and then it will fill in this information for me based on the information that it gets from Eventbrite. So I'm going to click on save and I'm done almost. 
I just want to let you know when you're creating flows by default, they're turned off. So you can turn them on right here. So if I triggered something in Eventbrite right now, this flow would do absolutely nothing because I haven't turned it on yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on. It gives me a message about, uh, we're gonna enable history for this project. We'll talk about that in a second. I'll go ahead and say yes. And we're done. This flow is ready to go. So now I wanna make sure that I've got Slack running. And we're gonna go here. And we're gonna tuck this guy off in the corner. One of the things that I wanna point out is how ridiculously fast Claris Connect can be. So I'm gonna go back to Eventbrite here and move this over a little bit. And I'm gonna go back to the bookmark that I had. Let's go ahead and edit this one more time. And I'll just put a period here, even though I don't need to make any changes. I'm gonna click on save. And before the screen can even refresh on the Eventbrite side of things, I got a message on my Slack channel saying your FM disk user group, Claire's Connect demo was posted. Uh, so I just did, again, very simple, I understand, but uh, if I were to do this with an API, I don't know how long this would take, but longer than it took for me to do it, even with my colorful descriptive commentary here. So that is how easy it is to create a very simple flow in Claris Connect. But now we're gonna turn up the juice a little bit, make things a little bit harder for me. And we're gonna create something where, again, just as a reminder, I'm gonna use Typeform, very cool form application. You can create, well, forms in it, a web forms. Uh, I'm gonna create a, or I've already created a vacation request form in there. I'm gonna send that vacation request to my manager. My manager is gonna get an email and is gonna be able to either approve or deny my vacation request. My manager is awesome. He's going to request, he's going to approve my vacation request. And when that happens, uh, my vacation is then going to be added to an Office 365 calendar. So let's go. We're gonna go back here, create a new flow, call this two. Um, approval, and here we go. All right, so the first thing we need to do is link up type form. So I'm gonna go down here, select type form. It only has one trigger to look for, so that makes it really easy for me. I'm gonna click on continue, much like I had to do before. Gotta click on a new and create, an, or not create, I have to link up my account. I've already done this before, so I'm gonna choose accept. I'm good to go, click on continue. So you can have all kinds of different forms in type form. I only have one and that's my vacation request form. Much like what I had to do with Eventbrite, I now have to go to type form and send a dummy request through. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to type form. Here is my vacation request, I'm gonna start. It's time for uh, Clark Kent to go on vacation. He's gonna go on vacation from April 15th to April 20th. That's my simple form. I jump back over to connect. Connect is happy, I get a connection complete and I save the trigger. Step one, done. Okay, step two is now approvals. So I'm gonna click on action again. Now this time, instead of coming down here to the apps, I'm gonna use one of these built-in ones that come with Claris Connect. And as I said, you can do calculations, there's some stuff with imaging, uh, you can create variables, schedules and whatnot. But I'm gonna zero in on this approvals one and click on that. And this is going to allow an email to be sent for approval. So I'll click on continue. Now here I've got to fill out some stuff. So I could do vacation request. 
Uh, I want to take some time off. The approver's email is me. My name. Oops. My name. The requester's name we'll come back to in a second. And then this stuff, if I wanted to use this, uh, if I wanted to include an attachment, I could. But then I can also specify due date, like how long does my manager have to request this to approve my vacation? All right, so let's go back up here again. So it goes without saying, this is no mystery now after we've gone through what I do with Slack, but I can absolutely personalize this message using the sample, or not sample data, the step data. So we can do vacation request four, and we can pull information. Now, here's an example of a, a different kind of payload that you get. Typeform puts all of the vacation, uh, all the questions first. So what is my name? Where does vacation start? Where does it end? And then it gives you the answers. So in this case, I've got to go down to answers and choose this one. I want to take some time off between my start date, uh, which is right there, and end date. which is not that one, which is this one right here. And then down here, I can pull the requester's name, just like we did with the subject. All right, we're good. So we're gonna click save. Now, I know we're not done with this flow yet, but I'm gonna turn it on anyway, just so we get an idea of how things are progressing here. So I'm gonna go back to type flow and I'll go back to my form. And we're gonna create a new vacation request. This time for Bruce Wayne. He's gonna take the same time off. Oops. All right, and we're done. Now I got to jump over to my email, which is currently being blocked by all the controls for web at, or for uh, Zoom. So we'll just do this. All right, and uh, look at that. Oh, that's the one I did from earlier today. Let's wait for the new one to show up. And there it is. So this is what it looks like. It has a vacation request for Bruce Wayne. I wanna take some time off between, we'll get back to this in a second, but you can see that at least for my brain, that's not how my brain sees dates, but we'll be able to fix that in just a second. But at this point, because I haven't done anything else with my flow, whether I approve it or reject it, it's gonna, in both cases, it goes into Never Never Land. So uh, it doesn't matter which button I select here, but I just wanted to give an idea of what we can do here. And I also wanted to point out these dates, see if we can fix those a little bit. So I'm gonna click on approve just to get it out of the way. And we'll go back to Claire's Connect again. So how can we fix those dates? Well, what we can do is we can insert some steps in between these two steps and use the data from it to format our approval email a little nicer. So rather than adding an action to the end here, I'm gonna add it in between step one and step two. So I'm gonna select action. And again, I'm not gonna go down here. I'm gonna go up and choose dates. Now I see I can add a date, subtract a date, blah, 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 blah. But here is an option to be able to format a date. So I'm gonna click on continue and see what I can do with that. So it only asks me for two things, the date that I want to format and how I wanna format it. So as far as the date that I wanna format, I'm gonna pull that from type form. This is the start date. 
And then much like in FileMaker, we have a whole bunch of ways that you can format a date. I'm gonna choose this one right here. This is more like the way my brain works. Month, day, year. And I'm gonna click on save. And then I'm gonna duplicate this because all I need to do is make one change to it. Instead of looking at the start date, in this case, I want to use the end date. Oops, not that one. The end date. Save that. Now, this is helpful, except what if I have like a hundred of these things? How am I gonna be able to tell the difference between this one and this one? Well, what you can do for many steps in Claris Connect is you can rename them to something that makes more sense to you. So instead of format date, it is a start date. And in this case, we'll choose this and we'll say end date. And you know, if I wanted to rename this also, I could do that. I'm not going to, but I just wanted to point out that you can. All right, so we've got start date and end date now, but we haven't done anything with this. So let's go back here. Although I think I may have to run this one more time. Let's modify this to use the new date format instead of the old one. So instead of pulling it from type form, I'm gonna pull it from here, but you'll see there's no data yet. That's because I haven't run this yet to be able to do anything. So there's no step data for me to be able to pick from. Now I could, rerun this all over again if I wanted to, or I could save this and come back up here. Save, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Oh, you know what? Let's go ahead and rerun it anyway. Uh, one more time. So we're gonna do that. Luckily I have plenty of superhero names to pull from. We'll go Barry Allen this time. He's gonna do the same vacation. All right, looking good. Go back to my mail. Wait for the other one to come in. Take a drink of water. Now these approvals, they usually come in pretty quick, but let's just say hypothetically, you've been waiting for a while like I have been right now, and they don't, it's not coming in as fast as you want, although here it comes right now, I bet. Uh, yep. I'm gonna show you another way that you can approve somebody's uh, request. So you can certainly do it via email if you wanted to, but we also have some UI built into Claris Connect that allows you to do it right here. So here is the pending one. I'm gonna go ahead and say, sounds good, and approve it, and I'm done. Now, of course, it's still gonna stay in my inbox over here, but that's just another way of being able to uh, use the approvals if you want to. All right, so let's go back here, and now I vacation request. Uh, I want to take some time off between, this time I'm going to use start date, there it is, and end date, there it is, and the rest of this is okay, we'll click save, and we're good. So we already know the email is going to work, I'll show you when we uh, do this one final time how the dates are formatted. But now let's build in that logic that I was talking about. If I click on approve, I want to now add a calendar event to an Office 365 calendar. So to do that, rather than choosing action, I'm gonna choose if then. This works exactly how you think. It works almost exactly like an if else in the script, if not exactly. It pretty much you set a condition and then based on that condition, you can either do things if the condition was true or if the condition was false. So right here, I am deciding what I wanna do. So the approval, 
status. Since I already approved it, the step date is already there. So I can choose this field. So status, we have a whole bunch of things here. I can just choose includes case insensitive. It doesn't matter. And uh, I need to make sure that I type this in because that's what comes back from the approval step. So I need to make sure that I type in approved right there. You don't need to put quotes around it like you would in, in, uh, in FileMaker. It, we know what to do with it. So click save. Okay, again, I can rename this if I want. It says that I should, but I'm going to uh, march on here. And now here is where I can build the things that I wanna have happen when it's true and the things that I wanna have happen when it's false. We're not gonna worry about this today. We're just gonna concentrate on the true stuff. So I'm gonna click on here. And now it's asking me again what I want to do. We're gonna to go to Office 365. Now Office 365 has a ton of stuff. And the one that I want to do is create an event advanced. Although it's far from, click continue, connect a new account. Uh, so here's one time where it did not allow me to keep my credentials. Oh. And we're good. So we'll click on continue. All right, this is the hardest part of the demo right here. Now, if for those of you who are in the ETS or the preview program for Claris Connect, you may or may not have noticed that we had uh, maybe a handful more connectors than we shipped with. Uh, we had to take some out because we're still uh, working on them, still baking them and stuff. Uh, when I initially was doing this demo prior to launch, I was using Google Calendar uh, as my uh, app to post a vacation request to, but we had to take that one out. But I struggled mightily trying to get Google Calendar to accept my dates in the format that Google Calendar wanted. It was hard. I looked through the API documentation. It was it was very specific. They had a very specific way of how they wanted the dates formatted. Office 365, a little more forgiving, but uh, there is a decent chance I'm gonna screw up the formatting for this. Um, subject line, so vacation, vacation four. I'm not gonna waste time with the generic Example, we're just gonna get right into it. We're gonna put the guy's name. Okay, so here, we're going to put in my start date, which is already formatted. Luckily, this is a format that I know works. Now here is the part that, is it US Pacific or Pacific US? I think it is Pacific. US. And then this one, we're going to choose the end date. Now I'm going to purposely mess this up. One of these is right and one of these is wrong. But I'm going to show you how we can determine which is which. I uh, don't care so much about the remind before or remind uh, here. It's an all day event. Yes, I don't need to worry about any of that and save. Okay. If all goes well, well, I know for a fact that I'm gonna get an error when I run this, but I'm gonna show you how we can find out how, where the error occurred and how we can fix it. So, but I'm gonna assume that I don't know that I have an error right now. And I'm gonna go back to type form one last time. Actually, that's not true. We're gonna come back two more times. I'll go with Peter Parker. He's also taking a vacation on the same days. Good, go back to mail. 
don't need that one. We don't need that one. Just to speed things up, we'll just do the approval on the web. All right. Now, if I didn't know I had an error or didn't have an error, I would open up another tab here and I would go to Office 365. And I would wonder why it did not show up. It should have been right here and it's not. So what we can do is we can look at the history and we can see up until this point, I've had a series of successes, but approximately 30 seconds ago, I ran into an error and I can click on the error and it'll give me some information here about what happened. Uh, it looks like Maybe I didn't need the quotes, which is very true. I left those in on purpose, but uh, it did not give me any information about whether or not I have the time zone right, which was a not a good plan on my part. But uh, the reason why I'm pointing this out is because you can fix these pretty easily. So if I go here, I can get rid of these quotes. <sighs> Come on. Yeah, get it. Oh, it appears the reason why it didn't work was because I forgot to put this in and save it is the real reason why it didn't work. And I do need the quotes. What am I talking about? Sorry about that. I think it is Pacific US. I'm going to save myself some headaches here. Okay. All right, let's try one more time and see what happens. All right, I messed up. So I'm going to assume that yes, uh, my time zones are wrong. So rather than go through that again, uh, let me just, um, I'll fix that real quick and then we'll, we'll be done. So another thing you can do is you can rerun this flow again, right from here by using this one, this button here. So if all goes, oh, you know what? That's not gonna, it's not gonna work there. 
you can rerun flows from here, but in my case, that's not gonna work. One more time. Hey, hey, look at that. My vacation has been posted to my Outlook calendar. Whew. Sorry about those little hiccups there, but um, I, I mean, that just points out that the formatting, especially when it comes to, to posting to calendars is very, very finicky. Uh, okay, so let's move on to a, a few more simpler things. The third one is we want to connect to a service that we don't directly support. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use something called a webhook. I know you guys were talking about that earlier. We have a utility for webhook right here. There's only one step for it. I click on continue. I gotta give it a name. My new webhook. And then what it does is it provides this URL for me. This is the callback URL. So I'm gonna copy this to my clipboard. Now this is the information that you would want to provide the application or web service that you're trying to connect to. More times than not, most of the web services and applications out there su support some type of webhook. It's just a matter of finding it in the configuration settings or the the UI or whatever. Um, one of the reasons why I choose MailChimp is it makes it super duper simple to set up a webhook. So we're gonna fire up web uh, MailChimp right here. And I'm gonna log in. Okay, so to set up a webhook in MailChimp, you just go to the settings menu. And like I said, they make it super easy because there's a webhooks menu option. So again, we're pretending that we do not directly support MailChimp. I already have some webhooks in here from uh, previous demos. And it's also worth noting that a lot of the behind the scenes things that are going on with Claris Connect currently are all done with webhooks also. So that is one of the reasons why Claris Connect is super duper fast is because of the webhook technology that we're using. Now down the road, we know that we're not gonna be able to use webhooks for anything or for everything. So there's a, there's a decent chance that as more and more connectors come out, we're gonna have to use other technology. But for right now, we're trying to use webhooks as much as we can. But we just isolate you from it by creating them behind the scenes. So in my case, I need to create a new one. So we'll go ahead and do that. We'll paste in the callback URL that I got from Claris Connect. It did not paste. There it goes. And then much like you would see in a Claris Connect flow, here are all of the different actions that you can look for when you are in this case using MailChimp. And when one of these actions occurs, it will send that information, the payload, to the callback URL that I just posted on the top of the screen. Now, just for sakes of making sure it works, I'm gonna check everything here, and I'm gonna click on save. All right, so this webhook is ready to go. If I come back over here, I click on save trigger, and I'm ready for uh, an action, which in this case is going to be, we're gonna send out a tweet. So I'm gonna select that, click continue. I gotta connect to my Twitter account. I should use Twitter way more than I do, but I don't. So there is a potential for some embarrassing tweets in my account right now. All right, so here is where we can, um, 
create the tweet, but I don't have any sample data yet or step data to um, test this with. So we're just going to, you know what, let's just delete this right now. I'm gonna turn this on. Why didn't it ask me for, to do something here? So for some reason, it should be asking me to send a sample through here, but it's acknowledging that this works already. Why is that? Let me create, maybe I use my new webhook. Let me create a new one. Steve's webhook. Uh, okay, let's jump over to here and look at this one. So this is already set up. I copied this URL, this uh, callback URL into MailChimp. And then I just set up a tweet that says the following subscriber has been added and I put in their first and last name. So I've enabled this. Let's see what happens. I don't have any contacts right now. Very strange why that didn't work. Add a subscriber. Um, All right, let's go over here to Twitter. And there it is. Even before I could get there, my tweet was posted along with all the other ones that I did earlier today to make sure it was working. So by using webhooks and a callback URL, you can connect with uh, applications and services that we don't support. So the last demo that I want to do is, and the one that people are probably the most excited about, is being able to integrate your data with, uh, or integrate your flows with your FileMaker data. So I have a very simple contacts database hosted up here in the cloud. It just is basically name and address. But I'm going to show you how we can populate that using a third party app. Uh, I'm going to use MailChimp again just because it's easy and because it captures names and addresses. But I'm going to connect it up the right way this time. So we're going to close this out. I'm not going to need it anymore. We'll go back to my projects and we'll create for FileMaker. This time we'll choose MailChimp. New subscriber, click continue. Add a new account. Strangely, it doesn't keep that. All right. Got my sample audience. I've got to add. All right, looks good. And now let's connect FileMaker. So setting up a FileMaker database as an action is much easier than setting it uh, one up as a trigger. Uh, if you set one up as a trigger, I can show you the directions later if you remind me. 
it it's, uh, requires a little bit of JSON knowledge and requires you to write a script and to modify your database, but using it as an action doesn't really require you to do any of that stuff at all. Here are the things that you could do. You can edit a record, create a record, stuff like that. I'm just gonna create a record. That's the simplest one. Connect a new account. Now the nice thing about using cloud is it fills in a lot of the information for me. So I'm already authenticated using my FileMaker ID. So it knows a lot of this information already. So I can just click the stuff that I want. I only have one file hosted, so it's real easy to choose contacts that FMP12, sign in. I'm done, almost. Click on continue, now it's gonna ask me for a layout. So much like you have to do with some other, you know, API calls and stuff, you need to have a, typically you would have a layout already set up with the fields that you want to use. So I have just one layout in here, contacts, but it's gonna allow me to populate all of the information on uh, all those fields on that layout. So quickly, I'm gonna use the step data here to get all the information that we need. Address. City. State. Postal code. And email address. All right, save, and we're done. So now I'm gonna tuck this guy over here, move this over. I have no records right now. We will add a new record. Oh, good enough. But guess what I forgot to do? Gosh darn it, forgot to turn it on. And there is Bob Jones information in my FileMaker database quicker than I could go over there and click on that window. Uh, that is pretty much all the demo that I wanted to do for you guys today. Uh, I don't believe I have any more as far as slides are concerned. As I mentioned, we have some collaborating uh, capabilities in Claris Connect you wanted to share in the joy of creating flows and projects with others, you can add people. It ties into the uh, FileMaker customer console. So you can, oops, you can add people just like you would a normal user in the FileMaker customer console, which I haven't, oh, it's not, it's not me. This is me right here. Whoops. Anyway, uh, why is this working?
Okay, wrong team. So you could just invite them like you would any other person to uh, collaborate with you. And they would also need to have a FileMaker ID as well in order for them to be able to participate in the collaboration with Claris Connect. Other than that, that's all I had for you guys. Uh, definitely open to any questions that you might have, or let me see if there's any in the chat. Um, uh, Dave and then Scott have questions for you. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely, hi. Okay, so great demonstration, I loved it. And uh, I noticed that with MailChimp seems to present the options as key value pairs, which are very easy to see, the state in California, nice and easy. But Typeform seems to put all those um, the, the variables, names, all together, and then a big list of the field data separately. Now, if you had 200 fields of text, how that seems hard to work. Do you think they'll improve the interface for Typeform? So great question, that comes up a lot. I think what is happening there is we're kind of at the mercy of what we get back from the, the web services and the applications that we inter integrate with. So it's not like we can pick and choose the, 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 the payload that we get. I think it is what it is. Now with that said, this has come up enough times that I'm sure we're looking into it but it's my understanding is each and every one of the applications that you're going to integrate with, you're going to get a different, uh, you're going to get a different format in terms of the data that you get back. As I said, some of it's going to be really easy to use. Some of it, especially in your example, if you have hundreds and hundreds of fields, could be a little bit daunting. Uh, the good thing is, if this is a good thing, you really only have to deal with that one time while you're setting up your flow. And then hopefully you never have to look at it again. So there, there will be initial headache and pain, I understand. But once you get past that, it's not like you would need to look at it on a daily basis unless you're constantly updating your flows. So not a great answer, I know, but I know this, that's like one of everybody's favorite questions. And I know if there's anything we can do to make it better, we will. Thank you. Okay, and here, here's a name I haven't heard in a while. Scott Rose is here. He has a question for you. Okay. <laughs> hey, guys. Steve, thank Scott. you so much. Thanks so much for the demo. I appreciate it. We all really appreciate it. I have two questions. One is sort of a philosophical, strategic question. The other one is a technical question. Is that okay if I ask you both of these? Sure. Um, the, the quick one is sort of the philosophical, strategic one. I'm just curious about... Um, why Claris chose to sort of create this whole platform instead of just sort of becoming an app on an existing platform like Zapier, thinking in terms of we like instantly having access to like 5,000 other apps right out of the gate and introducing all those users of 5,000 other apps to the FileMaker, right? You know, people who've never even heard of FileMaker, but they're already on the Zapier platform. Was there a reason you guys decided to do your own system. And then, you know, we're starting off with just 40 apps and you have to build them from scratch, you know, on your guy's end. I don't know. I don't know that I can answer that question. Uh, I don't know what the thought process was of why we decided to blaze our own trail instead of going the, the Zapier route or some of the other routes that, as, as you pointed out, may have made more sense at the early stages. Um, that would be a great question to ask. Uh, hmm. I'm going to write that one down because I don't have a good answer for that one. Why? why th I mean, I certainly wasn't in the decision process. I just found out one day, hey, we acquired this company. They make this integration software that you can uh, connect two applications with really easy with point and click. Yeah. So, uh, but let me see if I can, fo I'll follow up with that. Because I'm always concerned about getting more and more people onto the FileMaker platform, you know, having as much exposure out there as possible. Sure. But, but yeah, so that was part of my, okay, cool. Thank you so much. From the technical, my technical question, you mentioned near the end of your demo that it's, 
a little more tricky to to go in the reverse, going from FileMaker to Mailchimp. Is there maybe do you have the ability to show us maybe a small demo of how we could maybe update something in FileMaker and then update? I them? I don't, uh, but I can show you the directions if you haven't seen them before. Oh, okay. Um, I have not seen those yet. So we'll just create a. So it's the same for whether I choose server or cloud, but I'll just choose server here. So it's going to ask you for this information, your domain name, your username, your password, and your database. I don't have that, but what I do have is I can do it from the cloud side. Come on, get an editor. I was also reminded of something else here as I'm typing, which I'll get to in just a second. Cloud is up here. All right, so uh, here are some directions. These are not well written, but basically you have to create a script that has a set variable step and you need to create this global variable called JSON data. And then you need to populate it with a bunch of action script information. And then this is the information that is gonna get passed to FileMaker. At this point, then you would create an insert from URL step and you would have this in there for the curl. And then here it says that you wanna set up a script trigger, but you don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily need to be a script trigger. It just needs to be a script and then you trigger it manually via button via whatever you want uh, and then here's the callback url that you could use as well uh, we actually put together a uh, a document that walks you through all of this stuff a little bit better and i know like i saw wim was on this call earlier i know he did something as well and a couple of other people have also so there's some really good resources out there that walk you through this uh, hold your hand a little bit more than these seven steps do. Mm -hmm. So I can provide the URL for the document that we put together. You can take a look at that. Right. And it makes it a little bit easier to understand what you need to do and give some pretty good examples and screenshots of uh, how it works. That is fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, so we'll go, we're going to go PDF for connecting data. Uh, Bob, what's the best way for me to uh, provide additional resources for you guys? Um, why don't you, um, let's see. Um, Uh, probably the best thing you can do is um, you can send them straight to me. You have my address. I'll post right. them to the FM disk list and that way everybody in the group will have them. All right. I'm going to pull a uh, browser window off to the side here and see if I can find it while we're talking here. You guys have to have more questions. All right. Yeah. Um, Ward, did you have a question? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I need to unmute for a sec. Okay. Uh, Steve, can you talk about pricing? Uh, how do you count users? So the best way for me to talk about pricing is just to show you the website. Yeah, I have that, but it's uh, how do you count a user? Is that the user that the end user? Is that the people that have access to both the flows? So uh, in terms of Claris Connect, are you mixing up Claris Connect and, and and FileMaker Cloud because Claris Connect doesn't really have a concept per se of users. We bill based on the number of flows. So right. we have two pricing tiers for Claris Connect, depending on how many flows that you want. So, well, flows and other things. So here are the 
pricing tiers as they stand today, subject to change. Uh, we have an essentials, which allows you to have up to three active flows and 10,000 API requests per month, but you're limited to the number of apps that you can use in those three flows to three. So if you wanted to use more than three, you would either have to move to the, you'd have to move to the standard pricing, which is uh, listed on the screen here. You get more flows, you get more API calls. Then we have these things called expansion packs, which allow you to add to the number of API calls that you get, as well as in the case of standard, you get extra flows out of that too. So everything that you need to know as far as pricing is concerned, right, is listed right here on the screen right now. Right, yeah, I, I did click on the wrong button. <laughs> but yeah, but I can answer the other question too. So a user, a user is just anybody who has a FileMaker ID account. Yeah. In the, right. in the case of Claire's Connect. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Fred. Fred, did you have a question? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I was dealing with the mute button. Um, I just wanted to uh, follow up on that last question. So an active flow is any one of the examples that you gave. Um, so in the, in the example of the vacation request form updating the calendar, that is one of the three flows? Correct. Okay. So in my uh, case here, uh, I could turn this one on, I could turn this one on, but I would not be able to turn this one on because that would be more than three. But I'm also probably one, two, three, four, five. I'm already using six apps, so that's not going to work either. So I would have to pick and choose what I'd want to do in terms of can I do everything in one flow? How many connectors do I really need to use? Things like that. So. Okay. The essentials we understand isn't for everybody. And we also uh, are looking into, as I said, maybe uh, even something a little cheaper than essentials at this point. But right now, as it stands, the, the two things that we have, are, whoops, I closed, oh no, it's right here, are these two guys right here. Okay, so that's another clarification. So you can have three flows and three apps, but that's not three apps per flow. That's three apps per account. Correct. Okay. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I can I can see myself wanting to go pretty crazy with this and wanting to have fifteen different flows, but it looks like cost wise, you really need to focus in on the exact flow that you want to do. Right. Okay. All right. Great. Um, Thank you. Uh, Dave Borland has a question for you. Hello there. So uh, I was just uh, uh, thinking that maybe it'd be nice to see. Uh, a video of using FileMaker as a trigger with all that complexities. If somebody could, maybe somebody's even made one, but you know, like on YouTube, it'd be really good to see using FileMaker as a trigger. That's one thing. And um, the other thing is, I'm just curious about the, the, the pricing that we just talked about versus competitors like Zapier, because I haven't really looked at the pricing of Zapier, but this is almost cost prohibitive for some smaller clients. Um, so maybe you could comment on that. So I, I can a little bit. Uh, the, the Zapier pricing, as I understand it, it's, a, it's slightly misleading. Yes, if you look at it and compare it to what I have on the screen right now, it is cheaper. But what you get with Claris Connect, you get the whole enchilada, where with Zapier, you have to pay for like, for example, uh, one of the one of the strengths, one of the keys that I pointed out during my presentation today was how ridiculously fast Claris Connect is. Like before I can even get to the screen that I want to show you guys that was updated, it's already updated. But with some of the lower tiers of Zapier, for example, uh, it may take five minutes. It may take 10 minutes. It's certainly not lightning fast like it is with, with uh, Claris Connect. And you have to pay more to get that extra oomph, to get the, 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 the instant updating like you're getting with Claris Connect. So yeah, on, on the surface, it looks like Zapier is, is, is cheaper. And in a lot of ways, 
you know, I can't argue it is, right? But when you start factoring in all of the things that we include in our pricing and all the things that, the comparable things that Zapier provides that you'd have to pay extra for, then the pricing starts kind of leveling out a little bit. But with that said, we know, we've heard it, uh, you know, Zapier and some of the other competition is definitely cheaper than us. But one way that you can kind of justify it and spin it is, you know, we give you everything without nickel and diming you with extra features like you would with like uh, buying a car where Zapier is kind of like, oh, you want air conditioning? Well, that's going to cost you. Oh, you want heated seats? Oh, that's going to cost you. Oh, you want, you know, this and that, that's going to cost you too. So um, that's, that's one way to look at it. And, and the videos, uh, before I forget, uh, the same resource that I'll send to Bob that has the PDF that shows step-by-step uh, -step how to connect to not only FileMaker Cloud and FileMaker Server, but um, on-prem. And for those of you who have played around with on-prem, uh, I don't have a demo for that, but it requires that you edit currently a configuration file that uh, is very finicky in terms of the spacing, in terms of uh, putting single quotes around things. That's all outlined in this PDF that I'll make available to you guys. But on that same page are, uh, well, there's three, but there should be four videos on there that walk through uh, everything from the basics of Claris Connect all the way to exactly what you were just asking about, how you can connect. So we have the written, written directions in that PDF that I'll provide to you guys and the video that is kind of the video companion to those directions. So we have quite a bit of information for you guys to check out. Thank you. Okay, Ronnie Higgins, you have a question. Well, howdy and thank you. Any guess on when you might have FedEx and UPS? <laughs> uh, so we're gonna be, we're, we, we're, we're slow to get going here, but we're gonna be adding new connectors all the time. We have a list, as you can imagine, everybody wants everything in the world. And we have a lot that we're testing right now. Uh, in terms of when they're gonna come out, I don't know. I, I have not personally seen a FedEx one, although that's been asked for a bunch of times. So I'm sure it's definitely on our radar. I know it's on the list, but I haven't actually seen one physically working, but I would be shocked if in the near future we don't have one. Well, thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question for that. Um, is there also an emphasis on not only, I mean, I can see how adding more connectors adds value to the product, especially, um, you know, in terms of like first time user looking at it and having a wow factor, but is there also going to be an effort to increase the depth of some of the existing connectors? Because some of them, like DocuSign is, is a good example. It, it doesn't really have the full, uh, you know, all the, all the possible uh, things that you could do with DocuSign and their API. Uh, the answer is yes. That is definitely on the roadmap as well, uh, beefing up the existing connectors. Uh, I think for the most part, uh, I can't speak for uh, DocuSign, but we try to take advantage 100% of all of the API that we can for that particular connector. So if what you're saying is true, I'll just make a call out that maybe we're not taking full advantage of DocuSign's API. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Dina has a question. Yeah, I have two, if that's all right. Um, first is what can you speak to uh, Claris partners pricing or benefits? Um, Sorry if I, I missed place where that information is, but I, I couldn't find it. And the second question is, if I understood correctly, um, it sounded like you said you turned off or, or didn't activate something like Google Calendaring um, because it was challenging. And so does that mean that if we try to use the webhooks with a service like that, it's gonna be more challenging than some other services? Well, okay, so let me clarify that. So we, as I said, if you were using the ETS or the preview of Claris Connect, there was probably a half dozen connectors that were in there that aren't currently in the shipping product. Uh, Google Calendar was one of them. There's actually a few other Google services that are still in the oven being baked. Uh, Google Calendar works perfectly fine. 
the the challenging part at least for me was just getting the format in in terms of my dates in a way that google calendar was happy with so uh, there's nothing wrong with it it's just i just needed to dig in i i thought my you know my pea brain i'm like oh month day year no problem that's gonna work fine well google calendar was like uh-uh, you need to have it in. And I can't remember what it is off the top of my head now, but it was, I think it was more of like a time stamp. And I didn't realize that at the onset that that's what it needed. But if I had spent a few minutes looking at the Google Calendar API documentation, I would have realized that and probably saved myself some time. Um, as far as the pricing for partners and stuff, I can provide that information for you also. Uh, shame on me, I don't have a slide for that, I don't think but I should have. Uh, I will make sure you guys get that as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Um, okay, and Michael Bateman. Hi, I just had to unmic. Thanks guys. Yeah, uh, I just wanna make a comment. Steve, I don't wanna talk out of school about the um, uh, deal I just got on, on a developer version of, of this for an existing customer that has a license for server and five seats. Um, so I, hopefully I haven't said too much there. That was a comment more than a question, but okay. Uh, you can comment on that when you want. The other thing I wanna know is, uh, and I can't see your face, maybe when you're speaking, I can ask you this because I wanna, uh, um, you can save us a lot of development time. Most of the things you can do with Claris, uh, you can already do with an API if you just have hundreds of hours to throw on something. So um, we're all just really, you know, um, you know, if I said to you, uh, Shopify, no? Anyway, I just want to know if there's any way you can give us a hand on any of these things. Shopify, Etsy, and Facebook are my big ones. Thanks. So, yeah, I, like I said, we we have a list, a huge list of not only requests, but connectors that we are currently uh, working on. Uh, I would be Shopify, definitely one of them. The other ones that you mentioned, Facebook, I can't remember what the other one was, uh, definitely have been requested numerous times. We have a database hosted that every time somebody in sales gets a request for Shopify or Facebook or whatever, you know, it gets, it gets a little tally mark next to it. So we have a good sense of what people are wanting, but we also have a prioritized list in engineering that they're working off of too. But with that said, we are definitely open to, you know, any and all re uh, connector requests. You can post them in the, uh, the community. We have the place where there's a special place where you can do it. So it's along the lines of uh, requesting a feature. You can just say, I wanna see connector X, Y, Z and post that in there. We're looking at it all the time. We know that 40 connectors is not enough. There's no question. There's no, there was no plan whatsoever that we were going out the door with 40 connectors and that you wouldn't see any uh, additional connectors for months. Our plan is to just keep churning them out. You're going to log in one day and you're going to see five new ones or you're going to see 10 new ones. That is what our plan is and that's what we're going to strive to do. Uh, after a month, we're, uh, we're stumbling out of the gate a little bit, I'll be honest. I would have expected to see a couple more connectors by now and we haven't done it. So, uh, but I do know that they're in the works. We did add the loops, much to my surprise, in the last 24 to 48 hours. So we are going to be making changes to the product. We are gonna be making fixes behind the scene. That's the great thing about Claris Connect is because there's nothing to install, you get all the bells and whistles without having to do anything. And we're gonna communicate as best as we can when these new connectors come out. So it's not gonna be the scenario that I just painted where you log in and connect and you're like, oh my God, there's Shopify, why didn't anybody tell me? Uh, we have a knowledge base article that has all of the connectors in there when they were introduced into the product, when new ones become available, we're gonna be adding to that knowledge base article. So we're gonna to try to communicate as best as we can. That's part of what my, my group, my charter is, is to make sure you guys aren't in the dark. Like I feel like maybe you feel like you are sometimes. So uh, this is kind of a brand new group. So if you guys feel like you're in the dark, you can come yell at me. <laughs> 
because I'm going to do my best to make sure that you're not. Okay, great. We appreciate that. Um, Lynn Allen has a question for you. Hi, Steve. Hi. Um, I haven't heard anything about putting Claris Connect as a benefit of Claris Partner uh, membership. Uh, that membership has not gone down in price and the benefits have shrunk. So is there a possibility of a developer license at a lower cost for testing and development? Uh, we're definitely looking into that. Don't have anything to share about that right now, but we know every demo that I've done, that is uh, easily one of the first five questions that's asked. So uh, hang in there. I hope that we'll have something to share soon about a developer license, whatever we're gonna call it, but something that you guys can use for, for testing, for developing that as a much uh, lower price point. Hopefully that's we, coming soon. Yeah. We can't ask our clients to pay for uh, their own license and then pay for ours as well. Of course. For development. So we know. Uh, so Thank you. hang in there. Uh, hopefully it's coming soon. Okay, great. Well, it looks like we ran out of questions, Steve. Um, All right. Thank you so much. That was very informative. Thank you. Uh, my apologies for a few bumps there in the middle, but uh, I will get you guys the resource page that has the PDF and the videos on it. I think you'll find that very useful and it's just a, a, a nice follow up to what we just talked about today. And then uh, I got a couple questions about like the DocuSign API and some other things that I'll follow up with also. So if you guys have any other questions, I think I used my email address a few times during the demo. You can always email me at steve underscore roaming at claris.com. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Oh, and the uh, uh, um, partner pricing too. I'll make sure that I get that to Bob as well. Okay. But yeah, Ed, if you guys have any other questions over the weekend or next week or whatever, I'm just hanging out in my house like the rest of you guys. So uh, I'm trying to work as much as I can. But um, yeah, hit, hit us up. We, we want you guys to get excited about this. We make sure that you uh, have every one of your questions answered. So definitely let me know. Otherwise, it was a pleasure. Glad you guys enjoyed it. Uh, be happy to do it anytime you want. And just have a good day. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks, Thanks Steve. guys. <laughs>